Uh, if you don't have to agree with anything that I say, you can disagree with it. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll use that as an opportunity for healthy conversation. So uh, who am I? Uh, Joe was saying, um, so I've, I've actually had three hats that I spin constantly. I'm the chair for the future of work with Singularity University, which is neither about the singularity nor is it a university. So we have some identity problems that we're working on. It's not about the singularity because the founders, Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis, who are old friends of mine, uh, you know, they talked about this mythical point where there's a crossover where our, you know, any, any computer is quote unquote smarter than a human. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever hit that point. And you might argue in aggregate, we've already hit that point. Uh, but it's really much more about exponential change. You know, people can leverage exponential technologies, especially to be able to um, help uh, really large numbers of people be able to solve important problems. We've got a consulting company called Charette where we dive in on strategies. We do everything from workshops with refugee youth in Amman, Jordan, to advising ministers of labor and um, education in countries from Brazil to Tunisia. And then we work with a lot of corporates uh, and a lot of schools helping people to just understand how to navigate exponential change. And then specifically, if you've got career questions, like how to do career decision-making and how to, how to uh, find or, or create uh, meaningful, well-paid work. Uh, I've actually, I was actually trained as a career counselor um, when I was 19 years old. So imagine back when you were 19, maybe you're still 19, um, the, you know, uh, suddenly counseling people in their 40s and 50s. Um, so I learned a lot about how people make uh, decisions about careers. And then because I never really spent any time in college, it's kind of ironic, but I've got nine courses on LinkedIn learning with about 850,000 learners. And, uh, and then just any questions you've got specifically about technology or trends or, you know, I've, I've we used to be the editorial director of six different technology magazines, including one of the internet's first consumer publications and one of the internet's first uh, news publications. So been in, been in Silicon Valley for a long time. Uh, and if any of this stuff is interesting, Joe mentioned I got a new book called The New World, Next Rules of Work coming out. And then my site, gbowls.com, I got links to just about every, all the articles and all that stuff I'm going to be talking about. So and these are the questions you were asking about. So Singularity University, I said it's about leveraging exponential technologies uh, for exponential change. Uh, and so this whole idea of an exponential curve, the idea that if uh, change, whether it's the price of a microprocessor or its performance or the speed with which we have adopted cell phones. Uh, if it keeps on doubling in a reasonable period of time, then you get these exponential curves. And, uh, and we thought you know, originally that the big impact was gonna be this increase of robots and software that were changing a lot of jobs. And of course they are changing jobs, but what we found out pretty quickly was uh, it really wasn't technology that's gonna have the biggest impact, it's a virus. And so the, I'm fond of saying the, the rhetoric, the story about the future of work in January of 2020 was about robots and software taking jobs. Um, a lot of you guys are going to be coding, you know, so you're, you're you know, potentially impacting a lot of work, but you're also creating new opportunity, tons of new opportunity. Uh, but the real reset, the great reset actually came from, from a, a virus. And so that's how people have experienced the exponential curve in, uh, in the past year and a half. But as I was arguing, I've been arguing for years, it really is not, you know, robots and software. And to some extent, it's not even a virus. It's our response to these things. And it's that change is increasingly moving at a faster pace. Uh, a, a friend of mine, one of his favorite uh, phrases is, this is, today is the slowest day of the rest of your life. It's only going to get faster. But it's also the scale. What we saw with the pandemic was just how rapidly, literally billions of people around the planet could be affected. Right. So what I often say is it's what's happening is we're changing the rules of work as we speak. There were these old rules and then there's kind of these new rules. A lot of people are talking about digital transformation, but there's these next rules uh, that have really been what a lot of people are adopting. And, uh, and as you're seeing more and more talk about distributed work and remote work and all that kind of stuff, uh, it's really what the next rules are. It's, it's unbundling work, unbundling jobs. And you're here, you're at this point where we're going through a you know, pretty substantial transition in the way that we think about work, the way that we approach work, you are actually on the cusp of what I believe we're gonna look back in 10 years and say we're some of the most significant shift in the world of work in modern times. And uh, you're not only on the cusp of it, you're helping to create it. When we talk about work, what are we talking about? Well, it's really just three things. 
It's a problem to be solved. It's a task that we perform to solve that problem, and it's our human skills. That's kind of it. It's human skills performing tasks to solve problems. You know, and what you've done since you were little is you've been a problem solver. Uh, you you became a trial and error machine to solve problems. Uh, little things like a toy that you wanted, big things like trying to get good grades in school. But there's a problem to be solved, and you performed a series of tasks, and you used your human skills. And so an awful lot of the way to think about work, the mindset to have about work, is that you're a problem solver, and that you bring human skill to solve the tasks that are needed in any organization. And that whether that is a problem that is about getting a team focused on a customer's problem so that you can develop a good software product to be able to meet the need, or it's helping people to actually use technology itself to do the problem solving. Um, you, you're a problem solver. And uh, increasingly, you're going to do that in a constant context of a team. Increasingly, you're going to do that in a project-centric way. You're going to do it in a problem-centric way, focused on specific problems. You're going to be managing multiple projects at the same time. And you're going to keep on having this constantly shifting what I call a portfolio of work. Now, in the old rules that I was talking about, well, there were a lot of tasks in organizations. And, uh, and then we talked about, oh, robots and software, we're going to take a whole bunch of those tasks and leave not much for humans. That's no longer the way a lot of the rhetoric is, have, is, is turning. It's much more, well, how do we make work as flexible as possible for humans? That is, how do we think about the problems to be solved? And how do we help you to have the work context that allows you to solve those problems in the most effective way. So when you think about pitching yourself to an employer, when you think about applying for a job, when you think about applying for a project, the more you can put it in the context of the problems that you know how to solve, that you're good at solving, what I often call your superpowers, the more likely it is that you're going to actually get that work. You're going to stand out against somebody else who isn't having the same focus and it isn't positioning themselves as a problem solver. So that's what work has been, is human tasks applied to, human skills applied to tasks to solve problems. Well, what's a job? Like, what are you thinking about when, when you go to have a job? What do, you, what do you do? Well, a job used to be an office. That's the where of a job. You used to, who, who did you work with? It was this on-site team, people you saw every day. What were you working on? Well, they're, you're solving problems. When did you do that? Nine to five, five days a week. How did you do that? Performing a series of tasks. And why did you do that? Well, you had certain values, but early on, it's because you wanted to make money. Like that was pretty much it. You wanted to make money. So that's what a traditional job used to be. And then a traditional company took a whole bunch of these jobs and put them into a hierarchy. And it was kind of like a box, you know? So if you're outside the box, you don't have a job, then you're unemployed. And you're inside the box, oh, you're employed. You're an employee, you're a traditional employee. And that's kind of the way, especially you know, what we've inherited from the industrial era, that's kind of the way companies have designed themselves. It's almost kind of like boxes. So, And then a career, well, your, your parents actually followed a pretty, you know, probably followed a pretty linear career path. They got a bunch of learning at the beginning of their lives, and then they got a bunch of work and then they had this period of leisure in what I call the period formerly known as retirement. My father, uh, who was an author, he called this the three boxes of life, learning, work, and leisure. And that, that's all what the old model was. Well, along comes a virus. Along comes what I call the Great Reset. Um, I wrote an article in early 2020 said, welcome to the Great Reset. I think this is going to be a, you know, not just a pause in the way we work. It's going to be a big shift. And then I wrote an update saying, you know, now uh, after the Great Reset or, you know, as, as we're starting to envision a post-pandemic world, uh, how are we going to think about this? And I thought it was going to kind of follow through three phases, falling off the cliff, then this rippling along the bottom, and then eventually this building back, hopefully better. But I also predicted it was going to split. There were going to be people who were going to have a lived experience where they're going to get things back to somewhat normal. That is, if you were a programmer, you're working on a project, you had a distributed team, you probably sort of shrugged it off. If you were a restaurant worker and your restaurant shut down and the virus keeps spiking and then dropping and spiking, then dropping, you're at the, you're riffling along the bottom still, you know, they're, they're here. You, you're, you are up here, you know, you've got much more flexible work opportunities and they're down there. They have much you know, fewer work opportunities. And it's the same thing for learning. 
people who did have infrastructure, internet access, you know, good computer, they could learn from remote. Those who didn't, I've you know done a lot of talks to students all around the world, and the best they've got is a is a feature cell phone with two kids all trying to do all their homework on this this tiny little phone. And so, your lived experience was this Venn diagram based on this infection rates, what's going on in your country, what you're working on, what your school is able to do or not do, and so on. And uh, so it turns out that in the in Europe and the Nordic countries, they have a phrase called same storm, different boats. So this has been what's different for so many people. Now, it just so happens that because many of you are focused on technology, coding, uh, software design, um, human computer interaction, you've got the opportunity to use technology to be able to have much more access to work, much more opportunity that has opened up the aperture and mean that there's a lot more different things that you can do. Uh, you can actually do more work at the intersection of a lot of different kinds of work. And it's also, but it's changed jobs and work dramatically. So, you know, I showed you the, the you know, these are actually the six questions Aristotle used to ask, the where, the who, the what, the when, the how, and the why of a job. Well, all of that changed in the Great Reset. And what you're benefiting from is the changes are all happening to actually encourage employers to adapt in the way that they think about how work is constructed. And it just means potentially a lot more flexibility for you as a worker. So we know that work has become more distributed. As a matter of fact, you know, I've asked this question for quite some time. Why, why did it take a global pandemic to let people work from home or work from a coffee shop or work from you know, in a distributed team. Why are we only thinking now about having people sort of structure their work in something other than that nine to five job? Uh, and so, and, and increasingly the label that people are putting on this is hybrid work, which is basically think of that as context shifting. You're moving from one context to another, whether it's how you're learning, how you're doing your schoolwork, how you're working on projects with your fellow students, it's whether or not you're doing projects, paid projects for internships or for um, jobs on the side. All of this is shifting dramatically. And you, we're at that point where I talked about the, sort of the third phase where we're, a lot of organizations are still figuring out how they're putting this stuff together. But it's important to understand that it is a work in process and you have the capacity, the more agency you have, the more you position yourself as a problem solver, the more opportunity you have to be able to position yourself as being able to do this much more flexible work model. Uh, what's happening with the who you work with, that's increasingly much more a distributed team, what I call a work net. What I was pointing to in the way that you're shifting from doing a nine to five job to a much more flexible job, I call that a portfolio of work, which I'll describe. Work itself, but when you do it, much more is when you can. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot of the same thing. Here we are now on 8.30 on a Saturday night. Some of you folks are giving me some of your time. That's very different. Uh, you're choosing when to do those kinds of things. I'll talk a little bit about the tool set for doing those. And then there's a lot of stuff that we're hearing more and more people are focused on purpose. So this is how jobs are changing. Companies are changing too. They're going from boxes to, and this is something that is, again, uniquely an opportunity for you to be able to leverage they have all these different use cases for work, contractors, crowdsourced platforms, using the WeWorks of the world, using TopTal, you know, TopTal for you know, top coders of the world. There's all these different platforms, contractors, subcontractors, sub subcontractors, um, flash teams. There's all these different use cases for work. Their organizations are now realizing if you're a really good coder or HCI, a designer or you're, you're really good at managing um, uh, agile teams, you, they, they want to hire you in whatever context you want to work. And so increasingly, you're going to find that the tr these traditional roles of just employees, sure, there'll still always be jobs, but they're going to be more and more of these use cases for work, and you have the opportunity to be able to leverage them. And so it's going to look more and more like this work net thing. And then um, I also mentioned purpose. Um, so what, what ends up happening, and you, you might have seen this when you think about projects you've already done or work that you've done before you fell into coding or work that you might do in the future, the way your parents or your parents' parents kind of went through the process of thinking about what the priorities for work were, 
you kind of started off with this baseline of just what you could get paid for, just any work you could do. And then it turns out if you keep on doing that, you, you know, you're, if you're good at it, you get paid better. Oh, that's a good, that's an epiphany. You know, one of the first jobs I ever did um, here in the Bay Area, I, I worked for an old computer company and I was basically taking two piles of paper, one pile of paper, making two piles of paper and then faxing it. Although you, you, you hopefully you've never seen a fax, you're probably younger than that. So, um, uh, so uh, then if you got good at it, hopefully you would keep on going and then you find out it's something you love. Not everybody did that. That's actually sort of an added value in your parents and your grandparents era, but increasingly, hopefully it's just something where you can find something that's at sort of the intersection of what you're good at and what you love. And then maybe as you got older, you'd eventually volunteer, you'd do something you thought the world needs. And this is kind of the old rules of work. Your parents, your grandparents probably just did work they could pay for and then what they were good at. And they might've just said, hey, I'm feeding my family. I'm putting a roof over their head. That's fine. But if you could also find work that you love doing, that you're passionate about solving particular kinds of problems. And in addition, you can find out what the world needs. Well, this is what I call purpose plus. As a matter of fact, a recent study said, um, I know some of you are Gen Z as well or whatever, whatever era you would label yourself in, but basically, Almost, almost nine out of 10 young people say they want an organization that's doing something that has a purpose. And so this is actually called Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I. And if you're interested, you can just Google it. You'll find a ton of people in um, Japan and especially in uh, Okinawa practice it. And, and they believe that if you can't do all of these things, be paid well, be good at it, do it, have something you love and what the world needs, that it's, you don't lead a satisfied life. And so what we're finding more and more is that a lot of young people are flipping the stack. They're starting with what the world needs, what they feel is most important to do. If they do that, then they find it's, oh, I love doing that. If you keep on loving it, you're going to get good at it. And then eventually you're going to get paid for it. And so this is what I often urge uh, young people to be thinking about is there's lots of problems in the world to solve. Why not solve big problems? Why not focus on some of the biggest problems that, that need to be solved and, and, you know, Sure, you can do little things, you can do little problems, that's fine, especially if what you need is just to be paid for it. But increasingly think about having an impact in the world and how the problems that you are solving can have a bigger and bigger impact. Now, Victor asked the question, how can I learn to solve a new question that's never been asked before? Well, first off, uh, there's a lot of questions that have been asked that just aren't answers. <laughs> Um, but if you can think about it this way, that um, I'm going to talk a lot about mindset, skill set, and tool set. The problems that the world needs to be solved, or rather the questions that, that Victor, you're, you're asking, well, somebody never has asked this question before. There's a mindset for doing that, which is that you're a problem solver. And one of the first problems you might need to figure out is, well, what is the question? What is the problem somebody needs solved? And first off, define that problem. Like understand the problem that you're trying to solve and especially understand the lived experience of the person that has it. Don't make up what that experience might be. Don't make up what you think the problem is. Make sure that the people that are asking the questions are the ones that have the problems that need to be solved um, or at least are involved in the solving of that problem. You're gonna find that there's lots of processes for doing that, design thinking, transition design, increasingly there's a tool set to help with the process of defining what the question is, defining the problem to be solved, involving the stakeholders who can help to solve the problem and continually iterating the solution for the problem so that you make sure it's adapted to meet the needs of those stakeholders. So that's basically the mindset to bring to it is that you're, you, you're a problem solver, you need to define the, the question as effectively as possible so that it actually relates to the lived experience of the problem that somebody has. And then they're involved in the process of actually figuring out how to solve it. So I'm gonna do one more part here on how careers have changed and then talk about some of the specifics you guys were asking and see if you got more questions. Okay, so Victor gives me a thumbs up. All right, so, all right, so I, I mentioned that careers, and this is especially germane to you guys now as you're looking at your career going forward. Uh, a lot of parents, they ask me, so wait a minute, my era, you got a degree. You, you know, 
four year degree, six year degree, eight year degree, you, you, you got the, the right degree from the right school. And then you got the right job in the right field and everything was fine. Well, that world might still exist in some fields. I can't tell you what field that is. I can't tell you that any job, any field is gonna be using the same skill set that you learn today in 10 years. Any programming language you're learning now, the shelf life of programming languages can be extremely short. You have to keep learning. You've got to keep adapting. You got to keep learning how to solve new problems. And so that old model of just getting a big chunk of learning at the beginning of your life and thinking that it's going to be amortized over a, a full on old career of work, 40, 50, 60 years, that you're also probably going to be living longer than an awful lot of your predecessors, your parents or your parents' parents. That's not going to happen in all likelihood in almost any field. You're going to learn now, but you're going to need to keep on learning. So what we're seeing a lot of young people are doing when they come out of college, vocational school, even high school is they, sure, they get a degree or they get a certificate or they go to code camp or, um, and then they keep on learning online. They get a day job for a while, but then they take a gap month with their friends and then they take another day job, but they're working on a startup with their friends on a weekend and they're driving for Uber at night. And then they take an online course to get a master's degree. And then, so it's a constantly shifting landscape of learning and work and leisure. And this is why I called this a portfolio of work. It's very likely that's what you're going to have. You're going to have a portfolio of work. Even if you have a day job, it's going to be an assemblage of projects. If you don't have a day job and you're solving problems for as a contractor, as a subcontractor, as a gig worker, as you, you're going to have a range of different projects still that you're going to be solving. And, and this is actually a pretty rational approach to a world of exponential change. You know, today it's a virus. You know, if two years ago you would ask your parents, what do you think is the biggest potential shift that could impact the world of work in the next 10 years? They would never have said it was a virus. They would have said something else, like it's robots or software, or it's going to be a big shift in, in uh, globalization and an industry evaporating. So these are, we can't anticipate what is going to actually kick off exponential change. Could be the next one comes from artificial general intelligence, or it comes, could come from fusion power. Either of those could completely change the landscape of work. But if you've got a portfolio of work and you are continually following your passions to solve the kinds of problems that are most interesting to you, then what you've got is much more of an opportunity to be able to continually shift that portfolio to generate income for you and to help you to solve new and interesting problems. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. So uh, you guys have any questions or thoughts or concerns? <laughs> that you want to throw out now. I've stunned you into silence. Or the, uh, or the, ne the Netflix uh, video just shifted to a, an important part. So, yeah. Hey, hi, so, Gary. I'm Victor. Yeah, hi, Victor. Hey, uh, it's kind of noisy over here, but um, I'm really, really want to ask this question. I, I saw you mentioned something about how the young people right now they thought what the what the world needs, and then they go from there. I mean, yeah, that's what I've been thinking honestly. Like my parents have been telling me, "Oh, you gotta be a doctor, and you gotta pay, you gotta be paid well." You gotta... <laughs> that's what my parents have been telling me, but I've been thinking like what the girl really needs and where I can go from there. So, but I've been really sometimes confused about what I really want to do. Like maybe someday I, I read this article talking about crypto. Oh, now I want to be a crypto guy. Maybe someday I read about new energy. Oh, now I want to be a chemistry guy. So I just want to ask you how like, in a world that the mentality has shifted from what you should be good at it and you get paid for that to what the thing about what the world really means and go from there. Like how should I you know, prepare myself for, for, for this kind of 
situation and for this kind of new environment? So, Victor, thanks for asking the question. It's a, it's a great question. And, and honestly, I just want to validate it. There's so many people, um, especially young people, especially when their parents have some vision for them or some hope for them um, that have, you know, this, uh, this sort of watershed kind of decision making process. And so first off, I want to encourage you to, to the, it, it, these are challenging decisions. <laughs> And I don't want I don't want to put you or your parents in a difficult position by saying you know I, I I never give what I think of as advice as in saying go do this field or go go into this job or that kind of thing. Instead, I want to maybe suggest a couple of ideas for how. So first off, it's totally understandable why your parents would say be a doctor or be a lawyer. In the old rules of work, that actually worked you could choose a field and it was pretty likely in 30 or 40 years you could still be doing the same job it probably didn't require you to go back for substantial schooling it probably didn't require you to shift completely different fields that was the old rules of work and there are some places and industries where that can still happen it's just less likely so here are some of the things to be thinking about. And uh, I'm happy to send Gerald some links to some of these things, but there's a whole bunch of tools that can help you to learn career decision-making as a process. That is to step back and to look at a couple different things. And, and I'm gonna put the back up on the screen, um, something to help sort of give you the, the, the parameters of what that, those things are like what those elements are. And, um, uh, but, but wanna keep on answering your question very, very specifically. So this isn't, this isn't a generic answer. This is specifically to what you're talking about. And so the way that career decision-making works is essentially it has you answer um, six core questions. Like the, the, the most effective career decision-making has you answer, um, you know, these questions consistently. And uh, it just so happens that uh, they're exactly the same questions that I popped up on the screen earlier. They're just, I'm putting them in a different format. So the, there's, a, there's a why, a what, a where, a who, a how, and a when of work. The why is what drives you? Like what makes Victor tick? What are the things you're passionate about? What are the kinds of problems you most like to solve? So those are the things that you feel are important in life. The what is what kinds of problems do you like to solve? What kinds of skills do you have that are at the intersection of the things that you most love to use and the, and the um, ones that you feel you're best at? And, uh, and, and that there's a whole bunch of tools to help you understand your own skills better. The where is what defines the kinds of places in the world you want to be and the kind of work environment you want to have. The who is the kinds of people that you think would help you to do your best work, how they think and what their values are. The how is also about values. Um, it's it's the, the values that you have in your work and the values of those around you. And then finally, the when is what are the steps? Like, what do you think you might most want to do? So when people go through this process at any point in their lives, and as a matter of fact, I'm gonna answer the same question for Lauren, because she's at a different uh, phase in her life. The same questions we need to go through over and over again to help us do self-assessment. I'm sorry, self-inventory. People often call it assessment. I don't like the word assessment. Self-inventory is kind of like you're going on a trip. That's what career decision-making is. It's what's the next step in your life. It's the next step in your work. So self-inventory is understanding what makes you tick and prioritizing these things so that you can understand what matters the most to you. And then that's, this is all the process of understanding what makes you tick. Then you can better apply it to scenarios for the kind of work you might want to do. So you can take this map, and I'm happy to send you all, I've got links to do it. You can go through these exercises yourself if you want. You can map this against different career options, which are basically just scenarios, right? So being a doctor is a scenario. Being a coder is a scenario. 
being a doctor with, or, or knowing medical problems to solve and using software to solve those is the intersection of medical knowledge and knowledge about coding. That is a career option. Um, and so it's the intersection of these things that can have an increasing amount of opportunity for you. And again, you're entering in an amazing, a golden era of, of uh, work where there's going to be more and more opportunity at these intersections of things, which is why it's so important to determine what your passions are and determine the, the kinds of problems that you most like to solve and the skills you most like to use. So that doesn't answer the question of what the dialogue looks like with your parents. What does help is when you've done that homework on you, and then you look at different kinds of scenarios for the kind of work that you might do, then you do research and you talk to people, you do informational interviews, you find out more about what it's actually like to do that work. And especially if there are intersections of things, you love the medical arena and you love coding, go find people who are writing apps specifically for health who have a strong medical background uh, or, or whatever intersections interest you. If you want to throw music in it, then go find people that are also interested in developing apps, but also using musical therapy to be able to help people, to be able to deal with anxiety. Or You see how you're taking this Venn diagram of music and medicine and coding and you're putting them together and saying, hey, that's a thing. That's, that's potential work that I might be doing as well. So that's the way to have the dialogue with your parents is they want often for you to be safe. They want you to be happy. They want you to be successful. They may also have some strong uh, images around medicine and, you know, being a doctor is, you know, they can brag about to their friends. Hey, my, you know, my son's a doctor or my son's a lawyer, but we want to give you the empowerment so that you're doing the things that you feel you're going to be most interested and most um, energized by. And so the more you can do that self-inventory, the more you can then show them the kinds of different scenarios you've looked at and showed them that there's tremendous opportunity for you in this area that you're passionate about. Maybe it is being a doctor, but it might be one of these other scenarios as well. And incidentally, this is a process to go through at any inflection point in your life, not just today, but in the future as well. Okay, so now I want to... Um, deal with Lauren's questions. So, um, so uh, first off, Lauren, I want to want to honor, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you putting your age. I'm, I'm 64. I'm almost 65, almost Medicare. <laughs> um, I still think of myself as going through these constant pivots in my own work. And I, I think of myself as not just a lifelong learner, but as a sponge for learning. And one of the reasons I love to do these conversations is I learn something every single time. What I think is really important is first off, I try to urge people to try as much as possible to avoid regrets, avoid thinking, oh, if I'd only had this 20 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever, it's always about going forward. It's okay, here's a tool set now that can help me to develop the mindset and the skill set to be able to go forward and do the, the, my best work, the work that I most want to do at this point. Because I'll tell you, my attitude is, I don't know how long I'm going to be working, but I'm not going to stop anytime soon. Um, am I going to have an 80-year life, a 90-year life, a 100-year life beyond that? I don't know. If you listen to Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis, I could live a lot longer. So my attitude is, for the next phase of my work, what energizes me now? And it just so happens writing a book for the first time. I know I'm still young, but I feel like I've got a couple of things to be able to, you know, people will listen to. Uh, but always thinking about at this inflection point, how can you use this tool set to develop the mindset and the skill set to be able to go for it? Now, when you've got somebody that's younger, what's different, Lauren, is that you have a tremendous advantage that no matter what you have done before, if you have grown a family, if you've done a series of work and never grown a family, if you've done jobs in different arenas, if you've had a range of different work, you have work experience that your younger brother doesn't have, right? So, so at 20, you said 21, yeah, 21 year old brother, 
he's got a lot of potential and possibilities in front of him, but he does, you know, he doesn't have as much work, work experience as you do. And so what that means is you have much more clay to shape to be able to bring to your decision making and the problems that you solve going forward. You have a lot more experience, you've got a lot more expertise, and you have shown that you can be a problem solver in a range of other situations. Whereas your brother is at the front end of that. So to an employer, to a hirer, you have a much greater range of ability to be able to prove that you're a problem solver and you can solve specific problems. And you have a whole bunch of clay that you can use, you can shape into these new opportunities. Whereas your brother has less of that. And, and so to him, it's a lot more sort of how do you choose based on less information? You have less information about the problems that you like to solve and the kinds of skills that you like to use. But at any age, it's the same pieces. It's doing the self inventory. It's thinking about different scenarios for the kinds of work that you could do. It's informational interviewing and then Ultimately, it's finding or creating that kind of work. Those are the steps over and over again. All right. So, um, okay. So Lauren said, um, "Oh, you searched through Google and found, and found this one." So, okay. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you find this useful. So, all right. So, other questions or thoughts, and then I'm going to dive into some of the specific questions that uh, Gerald had sent me. Yeah. Hi, Gary. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has any questions. Okay, go ahead. Okay, you're on. Yeah. Um, so I, I really, really like what you said. I think it was super inspiring. But like right now, I'm in UCPP. I'm a software UCPP. Um, but I just think that under our current uh, education system, like we are not really allowed to do what you were just suggesting, like the portfolio of work. Like we are. Like we have to choose a major, like at the end of the sophomore year, like we are like you know sometimes I feel like I have to be this this job I have to get into this job if I choose this major and as, you know I've been thinking about whether I should choose which major or I should take other major related classes to try out but I just you know I don't like I what I want to ask is really under our current education system how can I do something like what you suggested? Yeah. So excellent question, Victor. Okay, so the first, so the good news is the changes in the world of work were deeply impacted by the Great Reset. And a lot of employers, not all of them by any means, are going through a different mindset now. And the power dynamic, the table is shifting more to the worker. That's not in all companies, it's not in all industries. But if this lasts, when you get into the workforce, you're likely to have more opportunities. That is, more employers are going to hire you that wouldn't have hired you unless you moved to that location. So that's the good news. Uh, my son is 25. He's a graduate of Oberlin. Uh, he is running a project for a company based here in San Francisco, but he's based in DC. That might never have happened two years ago, like ever. <laughs> So, so I just want to tell you, so first off, you got a lot more potential opportunity when you hit the workforce. The bad news or the downside or the challenge is that education systems always take a while. There's a pretty long lag time and some of them never catch up. Uh, my nephew went to NYU to study acting and halfway through he fell in love with virtual reality. And he thought, hey, this is a marriage made in heaven. I want to keep on learning about acting, but then I want to learn VR programming. And I, you know, how many actors actually bring an actor's sensibility into VR software? Like very few, right? So wouldn't that be amazing? And why you wouldn't let him ch uh, change majors? They wouldn't let him tack on course. They wouldn't even let him tack on a single course for VR because of his main study. So the answer first off is that unfortunately education institutions are often inflexible in the way that they approach these kinds of things. And that is gonna change, that has to change if they're gonna be viable going forward. But you've got a system, you're committed to a system, you're gonna to have to work within that system up to a certain point. I wanted to give you two pieces of input. Like I said, don't give advice, <laughs> two pieces of input. The first is for all of you, no matter what your age, no matter what your focus, Anything you can do to dial down 
your feelings about the importance of this decision, you should do. It is really, really likely you are going to be continuing to learn and doing new kinds of work going forward. And when you look back from my age or your parents' parents' age years from now, and you look back at all the things you did, you'll have the blinding insight that when you were your age, if only you'd worried a little less about that decision, it all works out. It all would have been okay. So don't worry too much about that decision because it's the decision for now, not for Victor at age 60. But you, you don't have to make a decision that is going to define your success for the rest of your life. That is just not what the context is. The context is what is the best decision in the system that you're in right now? What's the best thing, the thing that you would have the most passion about studying now and worrying less about its application in the world of work. And there's two reasons for that. The first is that you don't know enough about the applications of what you're going to learn in the world of work until you get there or until you start talking to more people that are in the world of work. You just can't. It's a black box that, that remember I showed you the three boxes? The, you're in the box of education and there's this box of work out here that you just might not have enough experience in. Now, Lauren's had some, hopefully had some experience in it, but that's a different set of issues to, to focus on that I want to talk to Lauren about. But, but for you guys that are at the front end, you're a junior, a freshman, sophomore, junior, you might not have a lot of work experience. That box is a black box. So instead, thinking about what is it that I'm passionate about now? What fascinates me? informational interviewing to talk to people that are actually doing jobs in that field that are at the intersection. If you love music and you're looking at medicine and you're looking at coding, go see, see if you can find somebody that actually is doing music for apps, you know, for, for um, people with anxiety. Uh, but, but whatever it is that you're interested in, all you should be focusing on, what's the best decision I can make now in the system that I'm in? And what do I most want to learn about now? And then the application in the world of work, I'm not saying don't worry about that. What I'm saying instead is treat that as a work in progress, as you're going to fill in more and more information about what your opportunities in the world of work are. You're very likely to have much more of that portfolio of work. If your school doesn't make it easy for you to be able to have a range of different things to study, find the core, the thing that is at the core of what you most want to learn, and then look at taking courses online or other things that can flesh out the other pieces you want to learn more about. I'm not trying to say that's a magic bullet or that I have a magic wand to solve all those problems. You're going to have to prioritize, but dial down the importance of the decision and dial up, focusing on the thing you're most passionate about now and do more informational interviewing to find out potential applications for it in the future. So, okay, and then I want to come back to, okay, so Maya has a concern. There, I'm going to have to move this over here because I can't read this font. It's just too small. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, CS major, but I have other interests not related to computer science, product management, consulting, investing, and data science. I love all that stuff. <laughs> so first off, Maya, I want to tell you, awesome. Awesome. Uh, remember how I showed the Venn diagram a little bit earlier about your lived experience in the age of COVID? Now think about taking each of these different elements. But here's one way to think about it. First is your CS major. You kind of want to make sure you're really, you know, living that experience. I mean, be a CS major. Enjoy it. Uh, but here's the way to think about it is any one of these things added in when you do start shifting into the world of work, so you take a CS major, so now you know coding, you know agile process, you know, you know, you know, you know a language or two. Now, what would it be if you had product management also added to it? Oh, okay, that's that's awesome. Now, what if it's product management and coding and in a consulting environment? Oh, okay, that would be a different kind of work. That would be doing it on a project basis. It might be for a Deloitte, it might be for a McKinsey, but Okay, now, okay, now investing. Ah, that's okay. That's interesting. Because if you're doing it, uh, you're doing coding, 
product management, uh, and by the way, there's not a lot of people that are really, really good at product management and also working with coding teams. So the more you know coding and you've done the process, there's not a lot of good product managers that actually really do understand how to talk to, to people on the coding side, but you want to throw in investment. Oh, well, then it turns out there's a lot of VCs that have fellows programs, uh, you know, potentially like the one that you're in. And so there's, there's ways that you would be able to be doing that work, but then also being a fellow with a venture capitalist to see how investors are helping companies at the intersections of the things that you're most interested in to develop. Oh, and then data science. Well, you're going to use data science, you're going to use analytics to be able to solve a wide range of different problems. I'm not saying that you should invest in trying to add all those things and guarantee that you can cram them all into a single work role when you come out. Instead, think of getting the core of computer science and what you're learning now. Keep on learning about those other things. Do informational interviewing. Uh, take some on, you know, brief online courses. Find people that are doing the kind of work at that intersection and learn more about what they do. And then what you'll find is when you start to shift into focusing on the world of work, you don't suddenly, at the last day that you're a senior, suddenly have this epiphany, oh, I got to go talk to people about getting a job. You've already done informational interviewing to find out contacts and people at the intersection of these things. And I will guarantee you that if you take the time and you really are diligent about it, you're going to find somebody that is doing work at the intersection of all the things you love. Now, when you talk to them, you might find them say, no, that's not for me. Like, I don't, I don't love what that job is but at least find out what more of the possibilities, the scenarios are at the intersection of the things that you care the most about. So I'm not worried so much about spreading yourself thin. I'm worried about not diving deep enough to feel that you develop an expertise. Uh, Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway, you know, the, 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 the you know, Segways, um, he's also invented a whole bunch of other things. He tells a great story. Um, he, he, um, he said uh, when his father, when he was young, his father was an artist. And his father said, you know, Dean, you, you're totally different. You love engineering and that kind of thing. I'm only going to give you two pieces of advice. Find something that you love, but get so good at it that people will pay you for it. So that's the only challenge, Maya, with, with what you're talking about. I, mean, I hope I'm pronouncing it. It's not, it's not Mia. I hope it's Maya. But uh, the, the only challenge is not getting deep enough that people will want to pay you for it. Like you took one course in product management, and then you think of yourself as a product manager. That might not be enough in the world of work. It might be, but it might not be. My only concern about having lots of interests is make sure you dive deep enough to feel that you can develop a great skill set in that arena. And, it, and think of it as a portfolio that's prioritized. You're going to learn CS, and then maybe some of these others you'll just dive into a little bit less because you're not quite as passionate about them. Okay, so hope that was useful. So, okay. Light bulb went on in Lauren's brain. Awesome. I love light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. So, so Lauren, just so you, so just to validate your experience, Lauren. So I went to high school here in San Francisco and I barely escaped. Uh, and, uh, and, and I took a couple of courses, was never interested in college. My, my parents had split up, neither had much money. Uh, and so, so I just, sort of dabbled. And I, you know, in my early 20s, I must have done, you know, 25 different, different odd jobs. And, but one of the odd jobs I did, I fell into the family business. And my father was a recovering minister who'd been laid off himself from a job here in San Francisco. And he ended up writing the world's career manual. And so, you know, that's how at 19, I got trained as a career counselor. And uh, the, the takeaway I got was you should do what you love. And that's how I eventually made my way in my mid 20s to Silicon Valley. Here it was, 1984. I thought that all the good jobs were taken. I thought, you know, Microsoft was a big company. I thought, you know, there's, there's no, there's, you know, all the tech is, you know, what else are people going to want to do with a computer? It's 1984. We we're all using computers. I mean, what else could you possibly do? But I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And I got myself on a QA team because I found out I was kind of good with software, testing software. And then when I, tested that software and the company needed somebody to write a training program for it. Oh, I had done training programs with my father. So there's an intersection, computer software and training. So I wrote training programs for it. And then the person who was running the training program quit. Oh, they need somebody to run it. Well, sure. I, I'll, I'll try it. And then that led to one job after another in Silicon Valley. And so this is, 
I just want to evaluate your experience. This is exactly the same process oh. I went through. It's like, I just didn't, you know, college at the time wasn't for me. I ended up just finding things that I was passionate about and doing for work. And now I look back and I can say, I can point to every single one of the different kinds of work experiences I had that made their way into a book that I wrote. So as far as I'm concerned, it is all contributive to what you can do going forward. It's all contributive. Yeah, so good, okay. Any other, any other questions or thoughts that I was gonna dive into some of the specifics that, oh, we got people just hopping in. Uh, hi, Gary, I just have one question if you don't mind. So um, last year, I basically worked on a project um, that was uh, mainly focused on connecting students with people in the workforce. So this actually stemmed from a personal experience where I noticed that, you know, a lot of uh, college students were having trouble picking their majors and stuff. And uh, especially international students, they don't really have the, uh, I would say, the comfort to spend a lot of money and experiment with classes because, you know, classes are usually expensive for a lot of students. And so I kind of like figured out an opportunity there and I, I, I thought, okay, maybe how about we just connect these students to people in the workforce and then maybe ha maybe pay the people in the workforce to give advice to the students, right? And so I presented this idea to a, in a business competition, but like all the feedback that I got was super negative, you know, because everyone was like, you get advice on the internet and, you know, it's basically free. So why would you pay someone to give you advice, you know, on, on your website? But yeah. the thing is that the internet has really, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say all of it, but most of the times the information you get on the internet is really inaccurate and probably given by people who have no expert in their, in that field, right? And so how would you normally tackle that problem? Because I see a lot of people getting, you know, discouraged by reading, reading reviews on the internet and, you know, then changing their majors immediately. And I, I don't, I don't see, you know, any patients within college students, at least the ones that I know of. They usually like they, they read one bad review on the internet and they change their major right away. And so how, how would you tackle that problem generally? Because I believe that the startup had really good potential, but then it didn't really get the push it needed. Yeah, so Sam, it's a good question. So, um, and it just happens to be an arena I know a lot about, like I know a lot of companies that are innovating in this space. And so um, let, me, let me just tell you, I'm gonna distill down sort of the problem domain and then I'll, I'll point you to some ideas around the solutions domain. And there's a lot of innovators in this space. So uh, it's always important. I've, I've advised countless startups um, and it's always important to do a really good scan to understand what people are already out there, the kinds of problems that they're solving and see whether or not you want to instead join and amplify their work or whether you want to start something individually yourself. Um, I would certainly say, you know, don't don't listen to a lot of the negative feedback that you get because normally the people don't, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily have uh, your passion or, or um, under, you know, understand enough about the domain to be able to give you the best advice in all cases. Um, and I, I'm often, I'm one of those people that does give, I wouldn't call it negative advice, but I certainly am the one that will test an idea. <laughs> Because if you can get past some of the hard questions that I ask and you can keep going, then you're going to be a good entrepreneur. So for a couple of things, Sam. So first off, I'm going to oversimplify, but basically think of work markets as basically having just two things. There's the supply side. That's us, messy, expensive humans and our skills. Remember, skills applied to tasks to solve problems. And there's the demand side. I call them hirers. A lot of people call them employers, but there's hirers, right? And so you have certain attributes and things you care about and priorities. And the hirer has certain problems to be solved and they put a certain value on those problems to be solved. So that's an oversimplification, but that's essentially how work markets work, right? Uh, you, you find somebody that has money that wants to pay you or if you're willing to not work for pay, to still a problem to be solved. Uh, and, and then you dynamically bind around those problems. We call that a job or we call that a consulting gig. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then hopefully everybody's happy that you know, they, they, they have money, they pay you, you get, you, know, you get to be able to solve problems that are interesting to you and the hirer gets a problem to be solved. Now, what's different in a world of exponential change is that information asymmetry and market signals have a huge impact on how all this works. <laughs> so you typically, as the 
the worker, you, you don't have all the information about yourself. You've got some information, but you don't always know what your best loved skills are. You can't always articulate the kinds of problems you most want to solve. So you've got information asymmetry about yourself, but you also, you can't possibly know all the work that's out there. You can't possibly know what people hire for. You can't possibly know every single different kind of job title that people are interested in. I talked about intersections. Did you know that there is a job that is the intersection of space and plants? It's called astrobotany. I had no idea. There are all these different kinds of job opportunities out there that you just, you can't possibly know. And you can't possibly know what the priorities are that people hire for. And you can't possibly know what they think of as the qualifications for them. What you do know is that they have problems to solve. Now, how do you help somebody who doesn't have a lot of information about the job market or about the work market, work opportunity to get better information and then to be able to potentially connect to it to work? Well, you're right. There's a whole bunch of advice out there on the internet. What happens when you don't have a lot of information is you get a new piece of information and you think it solves your problem, it, it puts you on the path to the kind of work you most want to do. You're right. A lot of young people will try to make decisions off of very little information. And if somebody tells them, hey, you know what? Python programmers. We're going to need Python programmers in 20 years. Where there's so much demand, you should just be a Python programmer. Maybe there will be demand in 20 years. Maybe there won't be. Who knows? What you need is a process for helping to at least understand more about the work market opportunities to be able to make the best decision you can under the current circumstances, which is sort of act, act, answering part of Victor's question. So what many people have done, there are lots of different software companies that are out there that have tried to solve this in a bunch of different ways. What some are doing is they're trying to take the, the market signals, the demand signals from the employer and just make them more explicit. So there's a program called Grow with Google. And what the woman who runs it, Lisa Gavelber, if you want to see an interest, I, I, I've known Lisa since she, she started at Google. Uh, we, we've got a site called Global Skills Day. We just did a conference a week ago. My wife and I produced a conference, 125 speakers in uh, uh, 25 countries. Uh, there's this amazing woman named Shua Chen, who was uh, one of the moderators for one of our sessions. She was awesome. Uh, and, uh, and there's a session where I interview Lisa and she talks about Grow with Google. What Google has done is they've tried to take a whole bunch of information about their demand, exactly the kind of jobs, exactly the skills they're looking for, exactly what they hire for, put it online and then put the courses out there. So you can increase the demand side to have accurate information about what they're hiring for, the kinds of jobs that they have. And then on the supply side, you know, us, <laughs> job seekers, you can help them to be able to have more and better information, higher quality information. The problem is they're not willing to pay for it, or rather they're rarely willing to pay for it. Older people who have been at careers for a long time. If you can give them access to better information, they might pay for it, or they might pay for if there's a good result, like you help them to understand the work opportunity, you help them get connected to employer, they get a job, then they might pay you. But for the most part, what people are doing is they're trying to solve the demand problem by having more signals come from employers. And they're trying to solve the supply problem by helping people to be able to self inventory more accurately because the more self driven you are, it turns out you get jobs better. If you're driven by your passions, if you think you're a problem solver, if you can prove that you've solved specific kinds of problems, you can tell an employer, you're more likely to get that job. Now, that isn't to say there isn't a market for better information about different jobs and market opportunities. It's just that the business model of doing that, you've got to be a lot more creative. And so there, for instance, if you want a good example, look at Mentor Cloud. Mentor Cloud is a mentorship platform. And a lot of it is around the context of helping young people to be able to talk to people who've done the jobs they're interested in. So, and what they do is they get the corporates to pay because if you're trying to get individuals to pay, you know, normally the two kinds of, of audiences you don't want to make money off of are startups and, and unemployed people. Like that's kind of, you know, they don't have any money. Um, so you want to find a business model that can actually make that market work more effectively. You just got to make sure it's typically going to be coming from the employer side or from a third party, which is typically a foundation or a government. So 
don't know if that's helpful, but um, I, I would definitely, uh, one, one of the great uh, sessions that we had at Global Skills Day was um, uh, uh, there's a learning platforms at scale uh, and, and there's five great innovators that could all tell you how to build two-sided learning markets and make money off of them. So just go to our website, uh, gsd21.com. I can put it in the chat, gsd21.com. Right, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much, Gary. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right, I wanna get back to some of the questions that you guys have, have had. So, okay, so Mia, Lauren, Eveline, uh, Okay, but Mia comes back and she says, to follow up your initial question, and I even, haven't even dived into all the questions that, that Cheryl gave me. So I wanna hit some of these bullet points if you guys wanna keep going. But um, okay, so uh, Mia's asking about, um, Maya's asking me about, so um, how do you know whether you've gone in depth in a certain expertise? What kind of strategy do I use to dive into the topics I'm interested in without having to do it all at the same time? So again, life is all about priorities. Uh, it turns out we, you know, there's this sort of finite amount of time we can all have. <laughs> How we use that time kind of matters the most. Uh, you think when you're young and you've got unlimited time and when you're older, you start to realize, oh, maybe it's not unlimited. Uh, but it's all about how you spend your waking hours. And so one of the reasons I come back to self-inventory and what drives you as opposed to what the market opportunity is, is that because of this asymmetry of information, you don't know what the work opportunity is out there, find out what you care the most about and prioritize that. <laughs> um, and and it's, there's a pretty easy way to do it. List on a piece of paper, the four or five things you care about the most about. And take each of them in turn and say, all right, I care about computer science, but I also care about product management. Now, if you could only do one of them, which one would it be? Computer science or product management? Oh, well, it's computer science. You put a little tick mark next to it. Then if it's only computer science or it's uh, uh, data analysis. Oh, well, I like data analysis. Put a tick mark next to that. Compare all the pairs and see which ones jump out at you. Done, you just prioritized. So the first is to make sure that you are, based on the thing that you're most interested in, that you are diving in on that one and you're figuring out what you feel is a validator, right? What And, and the validators typically come from talking to people in industry, asking them, well, how did you get into your line of work? What did you, what schooling did you need to do your line of work? And, and, and how long did you have to study that? Or how long did you have to develop experience to be able to do your line of work? And what you find is a couple of things. First off, everybody is going to tell you that they took a non-traditional career path. Uh, don't go to your professors in college, like especially the ones with PhDs, because they're going to tell you that they, you know, they went to college and they kept on going. So they're probably not the best source of information unless you want to be a PhD at a college. If you want to be a PhD at a college, by all means, ask them. But go ask people in industry. And what they're going to tell you first off is often, oh, Everybody else followed a standard career path to get here, but I follow a non-standard career path. That's the first thing they often say. Second, they're gonna say, yeah, I got all these degrees, but I couldn't tell you which ones were most useful to me. Well, that's often because, you know, we kind of forget things as we go along. We don't realize we actually learned critical thinking, collaborate with others, a whole bunch of other things. What they're often referring to is they can't jump, the, the special knowledge is like the information that they got, they can't, guarantee that any body of information was specifically applicable to a problem in the world of work. Um, I, you know, I buy that in some cases. I don't buy it in other cases. I think we tend to forget this stuff as we go along. But what you find after a while is if you know what you prioritize, what you care the most about, and then you find out by talking to hopefully a good number of people out there in the world of work, patterns will start to emerge. And you're going to find out a baseline CS degree. Yeah, pretty good idea. Pretty good idea because there's a whole bunch of things you can build on top of that. Uh, and then, oh, product management. Well, you can learn a lot of that stuff on the job in the, in the context of work. And so help yourself by doing that prioritization on your self, your self assessment, your self inventory, and then going out and talking to people in the industry. Hope that makes sense. 
Uh, and then, sure, ask your instructors, but only if your instructors have practical experience in the world of work. All right. So unless you guys have any specific questions, I'm going to also just delve into some of the ones that um, that Gerald had mentioned. So I hope I've hit uh, a lot of the changes in the world of work. And I know right now I'm sort of describing a land, especially if you're younger that you haven't seen yet. <laughs> I'm telling you what it would be like to go to New Zealand. Uh, you've never been to New Zealand yet. I got to tell you, New Zealand's an awesome place to go to. So, uh, so you should go there sometime. But New Zealand is incredible. It has all these amazing dynamics. You could be standing in a rainforest, looking up at a glacier with an ocean a mile behind you. I'm telling you the same thing about the world of work. You could be standing in a CS job that also allows you to do product management and to do data analysis. and. You, I'm telling you about a foreign country to some extent and, and trying to help you to see, well, there's a ton of opportunity. Often it is driven by the combination of thinking of yourself as a problem solver and being clear at the things that you're passionate about. Let me talk about some of the different arenas or different fields. Okay, so first off, having been in Silicon Valley since the 1980s, you can do the math. <laughs> I've seen a lot of cycles. This thing called the internet nobody really knew much about in 1984. The guy who was out there creating it, Vint Cerf, uh, if you go to that website that I just popped in, GSD20, you'll see I did a, a talk with him, an interview with him uh, as part of Global Skills Day because I've known Vint since the early 1980s and because uh, he, he was a very early internet guy. But basically what you find out when you see a bunch of different cycles of Silicon Valley is you're essentially trying to surf the waves. You know how I showed the old rules of work, the next rules of work, and the, I would say the new rules of work and the next rules of work as waves? That's what Silicon Valley technologies are. If you were asking me, where's a really interesting place to focus 10 years ago, I would have said cloud computing. Most people don't know what it is. Most people don't have any idea how you build technologies around cloud. I would take cloud computing. Now there's a whole range of different technologies that are being applied to a different set of problems. And in some cases, it's very clear what those opportunities are. And in other cases, they're at the beginning of the wave or there's a series of mini waves and we don't know what a scaled market is gonna look like. Cybersecurity, that's one of the ones Gerald had mentioned, we're going to have an insecure world of technology in 100 years. That's a prediction. I don't normally make predictions, but it's pretty likely. And the major reason is that there's a lot of really, really innovative people out there that are hacking all of the things we can possibly think of to try to protect ourselves. And they're doing it for a good reason in their minds, which is there's money to be made. Uh, but security is always gonna be an evergreen. Now the technologies that we use and the models that we use continually change. In the 1980s and early 90s, the security model for an organization was a perimeter strategy. So you can think of if you had a campus and it had a moat around it, that was the way that a lot of companies tried to design their technologies. And along comes this thing called the internet. You've got to attach yourself to it oh, now you're connected to a public network. You can't have a perimeter, perimeter strategy anymore. Anybody can get inside. All right, now we have to have a bubble strategy. That is, I've got to build a bubble, uh, a virtual private network or something around a set of workers. And now we realize, oh, well, any, just about any technology can penetrate almost any one of the work context. And especially if we let people bring their own devices, uh, just you know, technology uh, for virtually any, any kind of, um, uh, bad technology can be sitting on almost any device. Now we have to have a, um, you know, it's essentially a model that is continually adaptive uh, and is, is essentially the Venn diagram of a whole bunch of different characteristics of what that person is doing at any one particular time. Security, so security, evergreen, you know, if that's something that fascinates you, I'm going to pretty much guarantee you know, there's always going to be work so long as you continually adapt to new technologies. Blockchain and um, and um, uh, crypto. So 
in a world that is going through exponential change and where there's constantly going to be new and very, very creative people that are trying to hack new ways to be able to protect information and protect money and come up with new ways of being able to transfer money and new ways of being able to append value to something to, to digitally to something that has value. All of that is going through a series of mini waves and we don't know yet how all that value is going to eventually settle itself down. So blockchain think of as at one context or use case for being able to have something at the intersection of protecting information and protecting value and potentially protecting identity. That is going, if, if you find, if you're passionate about it, you're fascinated by it, I would say the underpinnings of needing to protect something digitally that has information, value, and identity is evergreen. Whether it's blockchain in 10 years, I couldn't guarantee it because blockchain has a number of assets, it's number of good characteristics or other characteristics that are effective for a market, uh, such as that you actually can spawn a whole bunch of different ways to be able to use the protocols to be able to create new value and a bunch of limitations. The way that we, the majority of a, a lot of blockchain uses right now, use cases um, are proof of work, which is very compute intensive. And there's going to be new ways to be able to validate a blockchain uh, transaction that won't require quite as much computing power. Uh, and so we'll probably have new ways of doing that in the years going forward. So I wouldn't, wouldn't become so invested in blockchain as a sole technology. I would say becoming very knowledgeable about the ways to be able to solve problems at the intersection of information, value, and identity. Uh, that's evergreen. We're going to be dealing with those for a long, long time. Uh, and then um, there was a question around uh, esports influencers. Um, you're in a unique time again. Uh, let me give you a visual to think about this. In the past, to be able to get into uh, having value and visibility in the world of work, it had to be, think of it as a pyramid. I won't show you this, I won't bore you with the slides of this. Think of it as a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid are the best paid jobs. It's the people that run companies. It's the people that started companies that were very successful. You know, it's people with you know, lots of, of assets and you know, the, one, the ones we think of as the ones having achieved. And at the base of the pyramid are entry level jobs and it's sort of everything in between. Now, what's happened is the internet has unbundled a huge amount of that. It used to be to get any kind of job that allowed you to have an opinion about something, any kind of job that allowed you to be able to create, <coughs> excuse me, something digitally of value, like a game, took a huge amount of time and money. Uh, you, you couldn't create a video game. You couldn't create a video movie. You couldn't, or a TV show. You couldn't, the, the tools to do all that were very expensive. And so you had to come in at the base of the pyramid and work your way up and it took forever. And sure, you could get struck by lightning and maybe you made an indie movie and it turned out you were the next Spielberg and, um, or you, you um, created a video game and uh, it took off. But for the most part, that kind of stuff didn't happen very often. Now, however, as the internet has unbundled so many industries, broken them apart. I've got a series of articles on Medium all about unbundling uh, the media business, unbundling higher ed, unbundling uh, work. Uh, you know, as more and more industries become unbundled, the friction to entry at the base of the pyramid has evaporated. You can start your own media business today. It's called a blog. You can start your own online video game using off the shelf tools. You can create your own movie using your, your iPhone. The tools have eroded the base of the parents to the point where so many can come in. You have a tremendous amount of opportunity, but so do a lot of other people. And so what's happened is think of the base of the pyramid as having grown almost infinitely so that the, there's a huge number of people that can come in, but that means also a lot more competition. And so there's a different skill set that needs to be developed to be able to get visibility and all that. 
what it means is a continuous amount of opportunity. There's so many different new problems to be solved as you think of more and more industries being essentially unbundled and having more and more people that can come in and think of ways to be able to disrupt them in ways they couldn't that couldn't be done before. Um, that's why you know investors like Schro have so much opportunity, um, and it's why you know so many of you, if you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, there's a target rich environment. There's so many places that you could be solving problems. Now, it's also true in corporations, also true in organizations, and, and with hiring people. And so, um, I just wanted to, unless you've got specific questions, I wanted to. Um, uh, oh, I think Victor had to run. So um, uh, the the questions about um, the that Gerald had, had put in about um, uh, what schools are not teaching but are required when you get hired, okay, and and the and the positioning of a degree and and how that compares to grad school and whether or not you you've got a a, um, a, a certificate from a coding camp and that sort of thing. So I hope that's of interest to you, but let me just talk about how some of this stuff has changed. So in the same way for you as a worker and your access to uh, the world of work, you know, think of that bottom base of the pyramid is you know, there's a lot of the friction is reduced. So there's actually much more opportunity to do work. More and more hirers, and I was saying this at the beginning, now that they're realizing, wait a minute, I don't have to have, I don't have to hire you and have you work in my office. You can work from some other place. Oh, that's amazing. Now I've got all this other people that I could be hiring. More and more hirers are realizing that they can open up the aperture. Some hirers are realizing that they can also reduce what they used to think of as the bar for the requirements of work. And this is not true of all hirers. You've got to find the hirers that, that are more flexible, that are, have opened up the aperture, that are willing to think of more opportunities. But here's the way I'm encouraging more and more hirers to think, which is in terms of the context of the problems to be solved. What are the consistent problems that you're going to need to solve? Well, first off, you're probably going to need, you're going to be asked more frequently to solve problems you've never encountered before. That's just going to happen. You're going to be hired into work. Um, I mentioned my son. He's working as a project manager uh, for an amazing project. There's 72 different stakeholders. He's bringing together all these different organizations. Never done it before. Never solved that problem before. But he used to be the editor of his school newspaper. 36 different students would be working on the paper, and he knew kind of how to pull them all together. Oh, so maybe he has actually run projects and been a project lead. And he just didn't think of it that way. But still, it's a new set of problems to be solved. And so that's the first one, is you're very likely going to find that what hirers are looking for is your capacity to solve new problems. That may not be what your school is or what you you're, you're, you're thought you were signing up for your school teaching you to do is to continually be a problem solver. So that's something that's really important to be looking for as you think of the projects you wanna take on in school and the kinds of things you wanna do for extracurricular activities, kind of internships you wanna do is how you can continually be exposed to new problems that you haven't solved before and figure out your own process of being able to solve problems. Second is you're gonna find that hirers are gonna look increasingly for people who with proven ability to collaborate and especially to collaborate with people with diverse backgrounds, diverse mindsets, and diverse geographies. So even now in school, the more you can be looking at the projects you're doing or the, the homework you're doing with your fellow students that have come from other backgrounds that think differently, Hopefully you're doing projects cross school. It's not just in the CS department, it's in other parts of the school. The more you can be proving that you have the capacity to collaborate with others and to do what I call dynamically binding around problems. So the five or six of you get into a room, the first thing you say, what's the problem we're solving? What do, we, do, we, do we understand the problem that we're solving? Okay, now, oh, I get it. Uh, uh, they want us to be able to develop this program. Well, you know what? I've had a lot of experience at the front end 
defining of requirements. And Maya, you've had a lot of experience at doing the data analysis. And Victor, you've had a lot of experience at breaking down the code into different chunks. And so, so each of you uses your superpowers to be able to collaborate, to be able to dynamically bind around the problem, solve it, and move on to the next one. That's the second thing employers are going to be, or hirers are going to increasingly be working, looking for. And the third is your ability to manage a portfolio of work. So work is going to become not just more problem centric, but project centric. And so part of it is going to be your capacity to be able to have a bunch of different projects. You're going to find more and more organizations are trying to unbundle jobs in their organizations and have people work together in collaborative teams across the organization in a portfolio of projects that is constantly changing. And again, if you can prove that you've done that before, whether you're working on a gig platform and you've only done one project or you're working uh, in an organization that has tons of projects, whether you're working across different domains in different businesses or different fields, or it's all in one domain or field, the more you can prove that you are you can solve problems, you can do it collaboratively, and you can manage a portfolio of work instead of projects simultaneously. That's what hirers are increasingly looking for. And schools aren't always teaching those things. So you need to be proactive about looking for each of them. Oh, and then the question about how that compares. Um, so first off, remember, nope, you know, not enough colleges stuff into a thimble. So I have no moral authority here. <laughs> there will always be employers, hirers, that will say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have a CS degree from Cal, you can't, I can't hire you. There will always be employers that will say that. And then, oh, you do have a CS degree from Cal, you're hired. Awesome. However, there will increasingly be hirers that will be saying, well, I know that's what I was looking for, but I can't find that kind of person. Or wait a minute, I need a diverse team and I've got already my Cal graduate. I need to have somebody that went to a boot camp, and I need somebody that learned um, in the real world. Never, never went to a camp at all, but learned a programming language on their own. And I need somebody who came from a completely different industry and then moved into this one because that'll bring a very di diverse mindset. And so that's what increasingly is going to happen: is you're going to find that sure there will always be hirers that will want the degree and will want to have you know what they feel is. You know, basically reduced risk. That's really what all this, you know, a lot of things around degrees are, is reducing the risk of the hirer. If I, I hired somebody with a Cal CS degree, you know, boy, they have to be great. You know, that's, that's a bar. Um, but increasingly more and more hirers are going to say, well, you know what, I, I need a diverse team. I'm going to have to have them come from diverse backgrounds, diverse paths. Um, there's a great group called Opportunity at Work. They call them STARS, Skilled Through Alternative Routes. Uh, people that develop their skills, not through a traditional route or through a traditional degree, but develop them on the job or because they were in a completely different field. And so that's what you're going to find as well, is it's going to be a, a constantly shifting landscape on the priorities of hirers. But again, in a world of increasingly distributed work, if the hirers in your hometown were looking for something that you didn't have, you couldn't bring to the table, you might be able to find a hirer halfway around the world that does want what you have. And because we're in a world now with hopefully more distributed work, you'll find more opportunity. So I think I ran, the, okay, other questions, thoughts, issues, priorities. I know it's getting late on a Saturday, but uh, you guys are young, so. I've sent you into silence or now you're watching HBO Max. All right, Joe, what do you think? Have we worn them out or are there more questions we should be covering or? I just saw a question by Lauren. Algorithm engineering jobs on the rise. Uh, so Lauren, are you talking about specific coding focused on algorithm development or um, is there something specific about using algorithms in an engineering context. Can you just help me understand a little bit more about what you're what you want to 
So, so, um, oh, I, oh, I know what you're talking about. So, okay. So, yes, there is an increasing number of organizations, especially in larger organizations, that are thinking more and more about integrative systems. So what happens a lot when you get into a big company is um, you, you tend to silo a lot of work. You, you, you come up with big problems, you have these big products and then you break them down into various components and then you keep on chopping and chopping and chopping until you've got a bunch of programmers, engineers that are working on different facets of it. What often happens is you don't have so the people that are looking at the infrastructure of how an organization develops its code and trying to essentially increase the quality and the um, consistency with which it approaches the development of its software and its applicability in the real world. So what happens a lot of times, one of the reasons I was saying to, to Mia or Maya, the, um, you don't get a lot of good product managers working with um, coders is that the product manager, just so you know, in a lot of companies, there's sort of two roles. There's the, the product marketing manager that faces the customer and there's a the product manager that faces, faces the development team. What you often don't find is that the person who really understands the lived experience of the customer is feeding those requirements all the way through into the development of the software, nor that the software as it's being developed is following a set of best practices to ensure that the algorithms are actually delivering the outcomes that you wanted. Um, and you see this in big systems and you see this where there's a whole bunch of well-meaning people that think they understood the problem to be solved and are reading the data analytics that are coming off of the software that's being used to solve it, but something's broken in the process. The algorithms are ineffective. They don't, uh, the data is not being crunched effectively. Uh, there's a, something you missed completely in the design that actually means that the system is not modeled correctly. All of those are flaws, that, which is why algorithm engineering as a, as a discipline is important. So yes, it's on the rise. It takes a big enough company or a consulting company that is working with a big enough company to be able to come in and, and these are often fix-it jobs. It's often code has been developed and somebody needs to come in and, and determine where, where the breakdown was and then build better process going forward. Yeah, so so yes, and insurance is one application. You see it in a lot of financial uh, 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 services uh, companies and you'll also see it in uh, medical applications because medical app financial services, uh, the quality of the algorithm matters a lot in medicine you know, people die if it's not a good, you know, if there's, if the software is not high quality. Other questions, thoughts, issues? I have a question. Sure. Um, did, sorry, I get, did, I pronounce your, did I pronounce your name right? Um, Maya, yeah, you're right. Yeah, Maya, okay, good. Um, so earlier you talked about how um, the future of work is like more project based, like building a portfolio of projects and like doing pro many projects at the same time. So I just, I'm just asking like, so like, does that mean like um, interdisciplinary skills are like more important than like being only good at like one thing, being only like really good at one thing. And like, um, if like flexibility and adapt ability is like more valuable yeah okay you asked two excellent questions in one <laughs> so um uh i was gonna uh, got a slide i wanted to show you but um all right so um uh i'll, I'll, I'll just arm wave okay so the first the first answer is to think about what you know as basically being in two bins. There are bodies of knowledge that are in a particular field that can take some time to gather. Your knowledge of a programming language, your knowledge of medicine and medical terminology, your knowledge of the insurance business. Those are what I call no skills, no, you know, your knowledges. 
So think of those as being like a vertical line that, that has some depth to it. And if you only learned a little bit about one programming language, it's not very deep. And if you got really, really deep and you spent a couple of years really digging into Python or C Sharp or something like that, then, then you've got a much deeper knowledge, right? That is anchored in that arena. That is, your, your knowledge of Python is probably not going to help you repair a car engine. And your knowledge of a car engine is probably not going to help you do better at Python. So that's kind of anchored. So that's one, those, those are no skills. Now, there's another kind of skills that are actually usable in a range of other situations, which I call flex skills. And that's critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, and so on. So think of those as being these more evergreen skills that you can always develop. Now, it just so happens that there's been this model that's been around since literally the 1980s called T-Skills. And IBM has used, has used this, but the basic premise is you're going to keep on gathering bodies of knowledge as you go through your life. And some of them are going to be really, really deep, and some of them are going to be more shallow. But you're going to eventually have more and more of a portfolio of those knowledges. But you've got these, no, these flex skills that you're going to be using all throughout the different kinds of work that you're going to be doing. Both are important. But what happens is, depending upon your choices for the kinds of work that you want to do, and a hirer's choices for the kind of work they want to make available to you, it's going to be a different mix of those. So in some cases, you're going to need deep, deep knowledge of your domain to be able to do the work. Um, I often say, I don't want my brain surgeon to have just watched a YouTube video and walk into the operating theater, right? So there's some knowledge, some no skills, take a long time to learn, and you've got to get deep on it. But there's others where, for instance, if you were going to do an app, to, you wanted to develop an app that used music to be able to help people with anxiety, you wouldn't have to go get a six or eight year medical degree to learn enough about anxiety to be able to help to solve that problem. So you might not have to go get a, a doctorate, but you might be able to take a couple of courses and get knowledgeable enough to be able to solve that problem. So it has to be this combination of what you're passionate about, what you want to dive deeply into, and then what the hirer or the kind of work either you find or that you can help to create, if you can actually create a job or you start a company. But there's these flex skills that you're going to need under any circumstances. So it's important to develop both. It's important to develop a passion for diving in on a particular kind of work and potentially multiple kinds of work, um, especially if you like, you know, you, you really enjoy going to college and you want to keep on adding, you know, another, uh, you, want, you want to do a, a multidisciplinary degree or, uh, but these flex skills, these skills that are usable in a range of different situations, um, there's, a, there's, a whole, there's a whole variety of them to learn. Um, I'll, I'll just give you, a, I'll give you an example of, of four of them that I, that I point to, right? So, um, and, and this does, this, this should have a, a slide associated with it because it's just a little easier to explain. So let me just show you this one um, and, and hopefully it'll help. Um, so, uh, and this is, this is relevant whether or not you, you know, for you as an individual, as a worker, or if you were going to go start a company, you were, you were going to be a, uh, you, you were going to be an entrepreneur. All right, so and I, I normally say there's four skills that you need to learn um, you know, that, that, that any hirer is going to be looking for. So the first one is that you're a problem solver. Oh, remember, I've been talking about this over and over again. You're probably so bored of me. He's calling you. You got to think like a problem solver. So, all right, so you're, you're a problem solver. You're also adaptive. That is, you are continually able to solve problems in new contexts. So this is one of the reasons I urge you as a student to continually find new problems to solve and do them in different contexts. If you did one problem solving exercise on your own, do the next one with multiple people. If you did one problem solving exercise in an area you're comfortable with, go do another one in one you don't know at all and figure out how to solve the problem. Keep on learning in new contexts because as I said earlier on, you're gonna be asked to solve problems you've never encountered before. It's also critical to practice your creativity. 
Creative problem solving is what is going to help you to be able to solve a range of problems you've never encountered before. And you can do this by learning techniques such as design thinking, uh, transition design, even agile. All the, the processes around agile have a creative aspect to them because you're working in collaboration with others to define problems, solve them, and keep on iterating your solutions. But then the, the fourth is with empathy. Now, why would I throw empathy? I'm like, that's a weird, you know, who's going to hire you for empathy? Well, it turns out that whether you're trying to solve a problem for a customer or trying to solve, them, solve a problem with people inside your own organization or with other students or a world problem, your ability to empathize with the lived experience of the person that has that problem is a superpower. That's a differentiator. So I call this PACE. You can see, you know, um, nice acronym, problem solving. With it. You've got to be adaptive, creative with, with uh, empathy. And th these are this, I point to this skill set all, all the time. I say this is what entrepreneurs do. They fall in love with the problem. They have the empathy for a customer's problem. And they're continually iterating as they come up with creative ways to solve it. Uh, it's the same thing in a job. If you are a problem solver is adaptive, creative, and would have empathy for continually solving the problem of the lived experience of whoever has it, that is a, a long-term value that you can provide. And it's increasingly what more and more hirers are, sol are, are hiring for. It's not the language they would always use, but if you can prove that you have this skill set, it dramatically increases your, your ability to present yourself as a problem solver to the employer. Other thoughts, questions, issues? Just a couple of other things then to give you just some other input. One is uh, get a brain trust. Find adults, find friends, find people in industry or you know, that you can think of as your go-to people that you can be asking for advice and try to find people that you think of who can offer hopefully useful advice um, and with different perspectives. Your parents, I love your parents. Uh, your parents, I'm sure, are wonderful at helping you to think these things through. Your parents have certain biases. They want you to be happy. They want you to be successful. Uh, I, I normally think parents over-index a little too much on success and under-index on happy, uh, but they're, they're, you want their input but they're often not able to remove their biases in giving you some of the best advice about career choices. If they are awesome, that's great. If you find that that's challenging, build a brain trust for people that are not your parents. Find adults that you trust, um, might be friends of your parents, but try to find them where they work at a range of different jobs and workshop problems that you encounter. If you try to decide on a major, pick three or four adults you know who know nothing about your arena and explain to them what your choices are and how you're going about solving those choices and see if they have some good input. And then as you go along through your career, continually build out that brain trust, continue to find people that are good, willing to give you that advice. And, um, and, and, and to me, that's a, just a tremendous asset to have going forward because especially when you're young, you, you, you want to be able to leverage the wisdom of others. Um, and then I guess last piece of input is this is a journey. What you're going through is a journey. You will know in 40 or 50 years what the journey was. There is no one answer to your journey. There's no one path to your journey. You're gonna continually hit these inflection points where you're gonna question what the next steps are. The more options you can build for yourself, you want optionality, you wanna be able to choose between at least two things. Most people aren't good at choosing between 200 things, but you at least want to continually be thinking about that you have more than one option to be able to choose. Uh, and you want to continually build out the skill set of navigating those changes, doing the self inventory, determining different scenarios, talking to people to get advice, prioritizing, and then picking the scenario and going. Most decisions you'll make will not be 100%. I don't know a lot of human beings that make perpetual 100% decisions. We make decisions at 80% or 60% or sometimes 40%. We're not certain, but we make, we make decisions based on the 
best information that we have available, the amount of time that we have in av available to us and the resources we have available to us. That's what an entrepreneur does. They never have enough time, they never have enough information, they never have enough resources. You're gonna continually be making decisions based on limited, limited uh, 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 limitations in all three of those. All right, so, okay. So Maya asked another great, or no, Lauren asked a great question. Is emotional intelligence part of the skill set? So I don't know if you've done, you know, you really have uh, died, uh, Dan Goldman's the sort of gold standard on, on uh, in multiple intelligences and especially emotional intelligence. So if you haven't read his work before and you find it interesting, then you, um, uh, you want to read Dan Goldman? I had a, had a great lunch with Dan one time at the TED conference and uh, where he walked me through his theory about multiple intelligences. And uh, it's really, really helpful. Uh, so the answer is yes. <laughs> An understanding of what emotional intelligence is, that is what insights it gives you in being able to sense the lived experience of others and to be able to verify your understanding of the lived experience of others is a critical skill set. Because if you're gonna be collaborating with others, you're gonna be working with others, unless you're gonna be working in a box, you, the more you can understand their lived experience and they can understand yours, the more effective you will all be. If it fascinates you, I'm going to guarantee you it's going to have a whole bunch of application in your work because you'll find that in the technology arena, and this is a big, big overstatement, uh, but in the technology arena, you don't always find people who are really, really deeply versed in emotional intelligence understanding. They, they tend to be more engineering focused and think of people as systems as opposed to thinking of people as human beings that have a range of different complexities about them. So the better you can understand emo um, uh, emotional intelligence uh, and the dynamics of, of emotional intelligence, of, and especially if you like multiple intelligence, because that's there, there's several different other kinds, uh, then the more valuable I think you're going to find those insights in your work, no matter, no matter what your work is. Um, and then there's also one other thing I would add is it's very helpful to understand mindset. So it just so happens that there's a book by the uh, uh, name by, called Mindset, by a woman uh, by the name of Carol Dweck. And uh, what Carol says is there's kind of two different kinds of mindset. There's a fixed mindset, sort of a you know more traditional mindset, and there's a growth mindset. There's a mindset that you're continually growing and adapting human being. Really, really helpful to understand what the different elements of a growth mindset are. And if you're young, you tend to be more likely to have one. And if you're older, you tend to be more likely to have a fixed mindset. It can help to explain if you have parents that are trying to urge you to follow a traditional career path to understand more about their lived experience. And it can give you a language to help them understand your lived experience because it's more likely you have a growth mindset. You think you will be a continually growing and developing person. And your parents may kind of think, well, sure, I used to be, but now I'm less so. Uh, the more you can understand why they would do that and why they would be so worried about you being happy and successful, and they can understand that you actually have this range of amazing possibilities in front of you. Uh, the book Mindset can give you a language for that that I find quite helpful. 